The Theban poet Pindar, circa 1518-438 BC, seems to have had strong links to Egypt, or at least to that part of modern Egypt which is in ancient times part of Libya, specifically to the temple of Amon at Siwa. The oracle famously visited in antiquity by Alexander the Great to question his paternity, and by me in 2002 to go on holiday. Here's a picture I took um, from inside the oracle where Alexander himself would have stood. According to Pausanias, writing in the 2nd century AD, Pindar sent Ammon at Siwa a hymn. Here's what he has to say. He's describing Boeotian Thebes here. Not far away is a temple of Ammon. The image, a work of Calamus, was dedicated by Pindar, who also sent to the Ammonians of Libya a hymn to Ammon. This hymn I found still carved on a triangular slab by the side of the altar, dedicated to Ammon by Ptolemy the son of Lagos. So this is Pausanias talking about his own trip to Siwa, where he saw the hymn of, of Pindar inscribed there in his day some seven centuries later. Here's some pictures also that I took from the oracle itself looking across the oasis. It's an amazing place if you get a chance to visit. Pindar provides us with the first clear evidence for Ammon, for Zeus Ammon in Greece, Greek literature, addressing him as Lord of Olympus, Ammon Olympu Despota, in a fragment of a lost hymn, which is now, we call it Fragment 36. Park argued that Pindar himself set up the sanctuary of Ammon in Boeotian Thebes, described by Pausanias, on his return from Cyrene in around 461 BC. But Pindar himself mentions no Theban temple. In fact, Pausanias' temple of Ammon in Thebes has been questioned as a case of mistaken identity. The great scholar of Boeotia, Albert Schachter, has suggested that the temple was not for Zeus Ammon at all, but for Zeus Karaios. He was a Boeotian god of mountain tops. His name suggests a meaning along the lines of the god with horns. As we know, Zeus Ammon was always depicted with ram's horns, so this might account for Pausanias' mistake, if a mistake it really was. Pindar is our first Greek mention of Ammon, but the oracle was around before his time, if Herodotus is to be believed. But he says that Acrisus consulted him in the mid-6th century BC, this is when he was sending around to all the oracles to ask about whether he should fight Cyrus or not. Here's what he has to say, here's what Herodotus has to say. Having thus determined, he at once made inquiries of the Greek and Libyan, the Libyan here is the um, Oracle of Ammon at Siwa, oracles, sending messages sem separately to Delphi, to Abai and Phokia, and to Dodona, while others were dispatched to Amphiraeus and Trophonius, these are two Boeotian oracles, another reason to, um, to focus your studies on Boeotia, it's such an interesting place, and others to the Brancidii in Milesian country, it's in Asia Minor. Even if the Boeotians had not set up an altar to Ammon in Thebes in the 5th century, by the 3rd century they were enjoying close relations with Egypt, Egyptian royalty through their famous festival and contest of the, of the Muses, the Musea, games held in the Valley of the Muses near Thespiae, and which were especially famous for competitions in the fields of the arts, such as poetry, drama and music. And it's to the Musea that I'm going to turn to now. The Valley of the Muses sits about 6 kilometres west of Thespiae, and about two kilometres southwest of the probable site of Hesiod's hometown of Ascara, if Hesiod lived there. Here's a photo I took when I was there a few years ago. The few surviving architectural fragments of the Sanctuary of the Muses, two porticos, a monumental altar, and a theatre built into the slope above the sanctuary, date from the later half of the 3rd century BC. And again, here's a photo I took a few years back. This is looking up the slope towards Helicon. The theatre is up um, a bit higher up the slope here, and this is part of the the sort of sacred precinct where a lot of the competitions took place. A few literary sources hint at the possibility that the Musea was already a competition as early as the 5th or 4th century BC. But our first, our first hard evidence comes from the middle of the 3rd century BC with the epigram of a multi-talented individual called Pythocles of Hermione, which is in the Argolid in the northwest corner of the Peloponnese, who won a crown there in an unnamed event sometime around 260-250 BC. An impressive dossier of now fragmentary and mostly lost inscriptions, once displayed in the Valley of the Muses, gives an outline of the reorganisation of the and upgrade of the Musea, kind of a revamp of the competition around 230 down to about 210 BC. These inscriptions must have been prominently displayed at a central location, possibly the one where my the photo was taken from, although the, their remnants were discovered widely scattered across the valley. One fragment was found in the walls of a ruined chapel that once stood upon the site of the monumental altar of the Muses, which suggested the inscriptions may have been on show close to the central location around which many of the contests um, 
took place. Such a position afforded maximum visibility to suppliants and contestants alike, with these inscriptions, which were considered sacred, visible at the most visited and holiest site within the valley. Three of these inscriptions, carved onto the same stone, record letters from foreign rulers concerning the reorganisation of the games. One is a letter from an unnamed queen, who calls herself a sister of a king, so is therefore usually taken to be Arsinoe III, sister of Ptolemy IV of Egypt. It was a Ptolemaic custom for the pharaoh to marry their sister, as opposed to the royal Boeotian custom, as um, shown by Oedipus, of marrying your mother. Arsinoe's letter accepted the changes being made to the musea, namely the introduction of a pentateric dramatic competition dated to around 210 BC. Pentateric, it means fifth year or in the fifth year, and that's what we would call happening every four years, just like the modern Olympics and just like the, pre, the um, ancient Olympics, which in many ways the Musea was trying to, to rival. A second inscription records a letter of acceptance from Ptolemy IV, Arsinoe's husband, here, in, here seen in Egyptian guise for his Egyptian viewers and here in Greek for his Greek viewers, um, and informs us that three thespians, three people from the town of Thespiae, Theoroi, um, would be um, people sent on a sort of a holy mission, um, these people were called Theoroi, or ambassadors, were sent to Egypt, no doubt to Alexandria, to bring news concerning the changes to the Musea um, to King Ptolemy and Arsinoe. The third, third inscription is a letter from an from a unknown king. A separate inscription, again from around 210 BC, records the gift received from Ptolemy and Arsinoe with which lands were bought around Thespiae and were rented out, and the profits from this renting um, gave funds to the running of the games. Now this really close association of foreign monarchs with the games reveals the prestige that games could bestow upon a polis such as Thespiae. The Thespians gained kudos through this link to the Ptolemies, but what did the Ptolemies get out of it? Well, they themselves benefited from the good PR of being involved and financially aiding one of Greece's most prestigious competitions at one of its most famous sanctuaries. But politics is also something that has to be considered. The Boeotians, especially of the late classical and Hellenistic period, were famous for being mercenaries, for selling themselves off to foreign armies. We know, for example, that the Boeotians formed a large contingent of the, the 10,000 soldiers um, who Xenophon writes about in his Anabasis. We know also that Boeotians were mercenaries for the Egyptians, and an inscription for Laodicea, the area of Ras ibn Hani in modern Syria, where we have a list of Ptolemaic mercenaries from precisely the time of the revamp of the Musea and the Ptolemies' actions there. This is the second half of the 3rd century BC. Among the list of mercenaries working for the Ptolemies, we find a group of Boeotians. More generally, we have evidence of other Boeotians in Egypt at this time, some mercenaries, some simple travellers. Lexaeus in his Hippocratic lexicon tells us, for example, that a physician and scholar, one Bacchius of Tanagra in Boeotia, was a student of the famous um, Herophilus in Alexandria. He was a, a very famous physician, Herophilus in Alexandria, sometime in the 3rd century BC. As for Boeotian mercenaries in Ptolemaic Egypt, we have an inscription for the, from the Nile Delta, a place called Coes. Then this is a dedication to Zeus and the ancestral gods by a corporate body of Boeotians from about 165 to 145 BC. Here's how it reads. On behalf of King Ptolemy and Queen Cleopatra, his sister, Phile Metores, which means mother-loving, mother-loving gods and their children. This was dedicated to Zeus ba Basileus. Zeus Basileus means Zeus the king and was very popular in Boeotia. There was in fact a big games with Basilea, um, which happened in the place called Libadia in, in, um, in Boeotia. And to the other ancestral gods, by Cephisodorus. Cephisodorus is a good Boeotian name. It means the, the gift of the river Cephisus, and the Cephisus runs through Boeotia. Son of Cephisodorus, uh, good name. Boeotian, who is chief of the bodyguard commander of the Coetan district and priest of the corporate body by that man's sons, Metrophanes and Ptolemaeus. So this man, Cephisodorus, with a good Boeotian name, has given his son the name Ptolemaeus, a good uh, Egyptian name, to successors and announcers and by the Boeotians gathered together in Coes, and the fellow members of the corporate body whose names are written on this monument, the sanctuary and adjacent structures. But for other Boeotian travellers, we have a rather sad account of a Theros, someone sent out on behalf of a god or a festival. What we have here is a terracotta hudria, a water jar, um, now in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has a painted inscription on it that reads, in year nine, uh, Mechia, Damo, 
this is missing, son of Nearchus, Theodos of Boeotia, by Theodotos Agorastes. This is someone who sadly died either on the way to Egypt or possibly in Alexandria itself in 213 BC. And Agorastes was a public official who acted on behalf of foreigners, such as arranging the burial of those who died abroad, such as this poor man. As a final thought, I just want to consider what happened when these travelling Boeotians came back, the ones who didn't need the services of an Agorastes and never came back. While some of them seem to have introduced the cults of the foreign gods which they had begun to worship abroad once they came back to Boeotia, and one of these was the Egyptian Serapis or Serapis. We know of a cult of Serapis from Tanagra, the home of Dr Bacchius who visited Alexandria, and Hellenistic Boeotian mercenaries are an obvious vehicle for the introduction of such Egyptian gods into Boeotia, and especially Serapis or Serapis, whose worship in Egypt may have been fostered as a means of integrating Hellenic incomers such as the Boeotians and the indigenous Egyptian population. There are even games like the Musea, called the Sarapea, which were inaugurated sometime after 87 BC in, in Tanagra, proving that the Boeotian ties with Egypt were still strong in the 1st century BC, some 1300 years after the first possible evidence of Egyptian and Boeotian links from the mortuary temple of Amenhotep III and the so-called Aegean list. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed these videos. I hope it's given you a more um, balanced view of what the Boeotians were like compared to how the, Egypt how the Athenians viewed them and given you an idea of these people as a cosmopolitan group and of the, the links that could happen in one little region of Greece into the, the greater world outside of Greece in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Thank you. Take care.